I'm uh, Greg Marsden from the University of Leeds. I'm the director of the Decarbonate Network. I'm going to say a bit more about the network uh, in a minute, but I'm going to start with all the really exciting uh, stuff. So um, there is a fire alarm drill today. <laughs> that, that will be interrupting Nathan and Keith during their presentation at 12 o'clock, uh, presuming we're running on time, of course. So, um, <coughs> So in the, in the case of a fire, uh, obviously you just make your way straight out of the building, don't take personal belongings, uh, don't use the lifts. Uh, the fire muster point is outside of the Benson building on Wellington Place, it's signposted at the main uh, exit. Um, toilets uh, are located sort of back out past uh, reception uh, and there's an accessible toilet on the right hand side. Um, there is complimentary internet access. The network is CP Leeds Wi-Fi. Uh, you just need to open it up. There's no passwords or anything like that. Um, we are live streaming uh, the Q&A uh, and presentations this morning. Um, so if during Q&A you don't want to have your voice, uh, but you do want to have your question asked, then um, just let us know uh, and we can make sure uh, that somebody reads that question out for you. Um, Please do take photos. I can't see anyone with a yellow uh, uh, lanyard on, but if you, they have got a yellow lanyard on, it's because they don't want the photo taking off them. So it should be fairly straightforward to, uh, to work that out. We're with the hashtag, uh, hashtag decarbonate uh, if you're following on Twitter. So do please feel free to share all of that. Um, we've got a live illustrator here today at the back of the room, Tom, uh, who's going to be visually capturing some of the discussions. He's not going to be doing portraits, although you could probably catch him at lunchtime if you want to. <laughs> Something like that. Um, so uh, yeah, he's just going to give us a bit of a flavor of the sorts of discussions he's hearing us uh, have. Uh, and if you haven't noticed, we've also got a large map of the, um, the north of England and some bits further south uh, over by the Christmas tree in the uh, coffee area. Uh, and that's for you to go and populate with post-it notes and scribbles and stuff like that to try and capture some of the interesting things that are already going on in decarbonizing transport across the north. So do uh, have a go at populating that. Okay, so that's the uh, administration. So uh, I'm delighted that uh, I'm able to welcome uh, Councillor Lisa Mulherin, who's the executive board member for climate change, transport and sustainable development for Leeds City Council uh, to give us our opening uh, welcome address. So uh, Lisa. Good morning, everybody. Um, I can see you're all nicely settled now. It's not the best day to be visiting Leeds. It's not always like this. So um, can I just say I'd like to welcome you uh, to the City of Leeds. My name is Lisa Mulherin. I'm a Leeds City Councillor. And as Greg has said, I am the Executive Member for Climate Change, Transport and Sustainable Development here in Leeds. In March this year, Leeds City Council declared a climate emergency. This, uh, following the findings of the IPCC report this time last year. Um, as you know, those, that report was truly sobering. And of course, the timescales in which we have to act are even more of a challenge. Leeds is committed to be carbon neutral by 2030, which is an ambitious target, but one which we are working hard to achieve. It's worth noting that the Leeds district has already reduced carbon emissions by 43% from its 2005 baseline. However, the Leeds Climate Commission, who we uh, work with, we're part of the Leeds Climate Commission, which was established a few years ago before we declared a climate emergency, and they have advised that to stay within our carbon budget, we must achieve a further reduction of 27% by 2025, and an additional 15% by 2030 equating to an overall reduction of 85% from that 2005 baseline. To meet these goals, we require fundamental shifts to the way in which we live, the way in which we do uh, business and the way our society works. There are big questions that need to be asked and consideration needs to be given to ideas that have previously been considered impractical. It's not an easy task at any time, but the need to do this in just 10 years should be focusing all of our minds it makes that challenge even more critical. Unfortunately, the current political situation nationally and the uncertainty that goes along with that have made it difficult to get national action at this most uh, critical time. 
As you'll appreciate, a challenge on this scale is clearly not one that a council can take on its own. Securing public, investor and uh, business support for carbon reduction is absolutely critical. The work that Decarbonate is championing um, is essential to this. However, we cannot ask others to make radical changes without um, showing some leadership ourselves. And to meet our citywide carbon reduction targets, we have already um, been making changes with the work that the council does. So we're currently holding the Big Leeds Climate Conversation with citizens in Leeds to help define the systematic changes that we need to make in the city and the changes that we will be putting in place. As well as this, we've been working with the Climate Commission's citizens jury, so a group of citizens selected from across the district of Leeds to represent the people of our city, and their recommendations will be released this evening. So to further understand this, the public perception of the issue of uh, climate emergency, to build a consensus on what we need to do locally and to gain public permission and support for action or as you put it in your four uh, interconnected themes, social acceptance and societal readiness. The council is already undertaking a raft of good work on this agenda. We're well placed to deliver some of the large scale and long lasting change that we need. Leeds Pipes, the city's district heating uh, scheme <coughs> is now near completion with heat already being supplied to over 2000 council flats in the city through the steam byproducts created by the council's energy from waste plants. We started construction of phase two of the pipe scheme in September this year, which will expand the scheme into the city centre. And for those of you that are um, currently experiencing the disruption on the hedgerow, that's partly because we're putting the pipes in before we do the work to improve the public transport um, routes through there. We're planning an ambitious extension of this to the South Bank once the next phase is complete. The council is also focused on projects that will reduce emissions and make savings from energy use in our corporate buildings and operations. For example, in October 2018, the executive board approved a scheme to fit LED lights to uh, all 92,000 street lights in the city, which will um, take approximately four years to complete, but will save over 8,800 tons of CO2 each and every year, equivalent to taking 4,500 cars off the road. Our new council building, Marion House, has been built with a view to ensure its environmental performance is much better than any of our existing council buildings. And in terms of the council's own vehicle fleet, 95 council diesel vans were replaced with fully electric vehicles, saving almost two tonnes of carbon for every 10,000 miles travelled. On average, over each year, this creates a carbon saving of, of approximately 255 tonnes of CO2, we already have the largest local authority electric vehicle fleet in the country, which by the end of 2019-20, this financial year, will have increased to over 300 electric vehicles. Council staff who are essential vehicle users currently undertake 5 million miles of travel in their own vehicles whilst travelling to carry out their work for the City Council, with an ambition that no council mileage will be undertaken in a petrol or diesel car. When you consider that those journeys are just the journeys that the council makes in terms of its day-to-day uh, -day work, it really hammers home that transport is critical to the consideration of climate emergency everywhere. It's a massively significant contributor to carbon emissions and it's essential that we address this problem as quickly as possible. Decarbonate's mission to support the rapid decarbonisation of travel is what I think everyone should be supporting. Recognising this is a problem that has different solutions in different locations, we all need to identify what the problems are, share knowledge and find funding to tackle the issues that we need to address here and now and for the longer term. It's a significant piece of work and I look forward to seeing the practical outcomes of Decarbonate's research. However, it's crucial that we help push a real shift in public perception and public behaviour when it comes to transport. We need to break the idea that one car, one person is the norm. It shouldn't be, and environmentally we cannot afford for it to be. As a council, we're in a powerful position to help people to reduce their use of private cars. We have an ambition to increase public bus use by 50%, and to support this, we're delivering a massive programme of works to improve journey times, information, and bus reliability across the city. 
As well as this, West Yorkshire Combined Authority are currently exploring options for participating in the current sale of our major bus provider in the city, First Bus, which would give the five West Yorkshire councils a much greater say and influence in how we make widespread change and improvements to bus services. We're also investing in new and expanded um, park and ride schemes in the city. The ones that we already have in place are so successful they are having to be expanded. And we're delighted to have secured over £3 million of European funding to turn the new Sturton Park and Ride scheme, which is currently um, under development, into a smart energy hub, complete with over 450 places supplied by solar uh, panels with a large battery, electric buses and electric vehicle charging points. As well as bus travel, it's important we consider rail and how that can support our need for more sustainable travel. The North, and particularly Leeds and the Yorkshire region, has suffered from chronic underinvestments in um, both transport and overall UK connectivity for far too long. The capacity of our existing rail lines are already past breaking point, and we need schemes like HS2 and Northern Powerhouse Rail, together with full, full, full funding for local public transport improvements, to create a fully integrated mass transit system to enable people to travel more sustainably. We want people from the Leeds city region to make more rail journeys, but Leeds city station is already the third busiest outside of London and the fourth worst in the country for overcrowding at peak times. We need services that use modern, efficient and clean green trains rather than paces built in the 1980s. We, we need operators that don't routinely cancel an overwhelming number of their services leading to chaos and uncertainty for public transport users. We need train and track that people will actually want to use. This is of extra importance when we are asking people to fly less. With airports expanding across the country, I wrote to the government this autumn urging them to take a national stance on aviation so that all regions are operating on a level playing field and that we can get the investment we need to make flying cleaner. <coughs> Long overdue improvements to rail would allow people real choice when it comes to travelling both nationally and to our near European neighbours. However, it's not just public transport that people use to get about. Cycling and walking are the cleanest, greenest ways to travel. They're also um, healthy lifestyle options for people, especially over shorter distances. And it's important that we provide support for these. We've been working hard to improve cycle facilities here in Leeds and our rapidly expanding new segregated cycle infrastructure. We're looking into detailed plans of how we can support people making shorter journeys by walking and how we can make places more people focused. Part of that is making our streets more pleasant and greener, which also helps to increase our city's tree coverage. And through increased pedestrianisation and improvements to the public realm, we're going to make our public spaces healthier and more child friendly too. Making sure that sustainable transport and energy standards are considered from the start of any new development in Leeds is critical for moving forward and combating the climate emergency. Through our role as the planning authority, we can focus the building of new homes in sustainable locations with low carbon <laughs> infrastructure. We've got some very good examples of that here, um, like situ in Leeds City Centre. We have specific policies in our recently adopted core strategy to encourage energy efficiency and renewable energy use, the management and mitigation of flood risk, improving air quality, sustainable design and construction and vehicle charging points. Because of the general election, we've been delayed in bringing forward our local action plan that would have been uh, published next month for addressing the climate emergency. But that will be published um, at the end of this year for the decision to be made in the first week of January. It will take on recommendations and feedback from a number of sources and people, including both the Big Leeds Climate Conversation and the Leeds Citizens Jury. There is sometimes a feeling of hopelessness for people when faced with the challenge and the sheer size and scale of the climate emergency. It's big and it is difficult. There are going to be difficult decisions to be made and we need public support to do that. But it can also be a cause for hope. There's not much time to make change but we have not passed a point of no return. People across the world are getting more and more engaged with this agenda and creating the momentum we need to see for change. Restructuring and decarbonizing our society is a chance for real positive change 
as well as bringing growth and economic benefits that can support all communities and no longer be at the expense of our environment. We need to recognise that economic, social and climate justice are all linked and that we need a new Green Deal to properly address this. One that has the benefits for people and the planet at its heart, which brings forward a green industrial revolution creating jobs for a just transition from the technology we now know is not only polluting our local environment, but at risk of irreversibly damaging the ecosystem on which we all depend. As I said previously, decarbonate research will be crucial in the coming years, especially considering the limited time we have to make widespread and significant change. I'm sure there will be some fascinating discussions held today that will help move this agenda forward, and I look forward to seeing how we can use this research and practical measures in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Moherin. So, um, a real flavour of the, the range of different challenges that we uh, have ahead of us. So, um, <laughs> let me move on then to just say a little bit uh, about the network and how the network can start to help work with organisations like Leeds City Council and many of the other organisations we have in the room. Um, we began the bid process for this uh, network 18 or 15 months ago uh, and to see so many people here from such a diverse range of backgrounds uh, makes all of that hard work seem worthwhile. It suggests to me that there's a need for what we're aiming to do. So um, Decarbonate is it's a research grant funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council um, as part of a collaborative discussion that's ongoing with the Department for Transport about how we can support a radical shift uh, in transport and mobility if we're going to get anywhere close to some of the ambitious targets which Council Mulherin was talking about. Um, but rather than just being a research project, this is an investment in a network. Uh, and these are some of the things that we want to see this network achieve. So everywhere faces the decarbonisation challenge. Um, there are all sorts of climate emergency declarations being made with different types of commitments. The question is what to do rather than what to say. Um, part of our aim is to act as a resource where people can come together to meet, to discuss these challenges. But it's much more than that. We want to work with Transport for the North and all of the actors across the North to develop, for example, shared data repositories. So we're not reinventing the wheel. We're learning from each other and we're able to pass that information rapidly across boundaries so that we understand the nature of the challenges and the effectiveness of different solutions. We want our meetings, as you'll see from uh, this afternoon's workshops, to be places where we try and build new consortium, make new contacts between people so that we can bring ambitious trials and demonstrations to the north and where we can share uh, our understanding about those outcomes early. And if we could decarbonise transport with the existing knowledge sets and solutions that we already have, we wouldn't be where we are today. And so part of the network is to create spaces and to fund collaborations where we can ask new uh, questions which are necessary to change things in the medium and longer term. We're particularly focused on encouraging early career researchers who are new to this challenge. We need to grow the field who are able to address this. Uh, and finally, we're not going to pull uh, any punches or have comfortable conversations when we need to have difficult ones. We want to act as an honest broker on the challenges and the progress that's being made. And that means shouting out the good things that are happening across the North. But it also then means saying, OK, and now what next? Because as was set out in the first presentation, there are so many different things which need to change in order for us to make headway towards our target. Decarbonate's one of uh, five networks that have been funded by the research councils, the others being on hydrogen, uh, vehicle to grid, connectivity, freight and jet fuel. And I have a coordinating role across the five networks and we will work together on some aspects of these uh, challenges. However, what's distinctive about 
decarbonate is that we've taken a place-based approach to decarbonisation. So I'll just say a little bit more about that. But we're trying to build a commu an integrated community of practice, sharing data and promoting trial development and learning across the north. <coughs> so there is a lot of work done on carbon pathways, uh, but this tends to be done at fairly aggregate scale. Decarbonisation happens in places, and those places have very different characteristics. Uh, and so what's going to be required as a solution set is going to be quite different. And across the north, we have that diversity of different examples. So we've got very uh, modern urban living in most of our city centres. We've got terraced housing. We've got 1960s blocks of flats, vast swathes uh, of suburbia, and many smaller urban uh, uh, smaller towns with a range of uh, transport challenges and some deeply rural areas, many of which are quite uh, well used by tourists. So we've got a real diverse and challenging set uh, of environments within which we can try and decarbonize and learn. And we start from very different positions. You'll see more of this sort of data in the workshops that we've got uh, this afternoon. And if you're at the back, you probably won't be able to see much of that at all. But it's a chart with lots of different uh, colored spaces. It's an analysis that comes from uh, looking at the MOT data uh, about how far different sorts of vehicles of different ages travel. Um, what you can basically see is that the, the, the blue areas here are the, the big cities. So you've got Leeds uh, over here, uh, York, and then um, we've got Tees Valley up there in the north of the, uh, of the image. Uh, so the, the cities have lower per capita uh, emissions, quite substantially lower than some of our uh, rural areas. Okay, so what are we going to do to, to decarbonize these very different uh, places? We also have to think about questions of scale. So when is it sensible for highly place specific things to go on uh, and technologies to be in a particular place? And when do they need to be joined up across different areas? So you can just think about what goes on in the middle of Leeds, but what about the big commuting belts that come into Leeds from outside? How do we bring those things together? Some things like local refuse collection might be highly bespoke solutions that work in a particular area, but other things may have to be connected right across the region. If you're an international freight operator, you need to have that interconnectivity. And there might be different uh, resources which are available. That's a map of um, biostock feed potential for example, across the UK. So there may be some quite specific, very sensible local energy sources that could be used. But we also need to recognize that some things are happening globally and it's about how we adapt those global technologies in our region. I'm just gonna give three very brief examples. These are just uh, uh, imagined examples of the sorts of work that Decarbonate <coughs> could get involved in. They are not a research program that we're specifying, they're just to get us thinking about this. So the first one would be, how do we accelerate electric vehicle uptake across the north? The chart there shows density of uh, electric vehicle uh, uptake uh, by the end of uh, 2016. Again, point of the chart is to just show how quite diverse that is. You might be able to spot Sunderland uh, and, and the Nissan plant in, in the top right hand corner of that uh, particular map, but we've got very different uh, uptake rates. So why is that? And what could be done to accelerate a different pattern if we felt that that was going to be important for carbon reduction? So at what scale do we need uh, charge point um, density to be high in order for people to trust it? How does that differ between urban and rural areas? And have we decided how we're going to fund all of this different infrastructure? At the moment, a lot of it is going through uh, local authority grant funding. But what's the future for paying for charge points? What are the business models that will go along with that? Rethinking behaviour change and um, <coughs> Councillor Mulherin said 5 million miles driven uh, in the council's uh, uh, employees own vehicles. So I think we need to rethink behaviour change, challenge ourselves that okay it's individuals that have behaviours but actually it's the activities that they take part in is the reason that they're traveling. And we could do so much more if we thought about the set of activities which go on in the North and how much influence we have on that. So for example, in Lancashire, 
30% of all employees work in local government, health and education. Actually, we've got quite a lot of leverage over a large amount of the travel which is done. Um, then we've got places like um, Manchester, one and a half million theatre goers. There's quite a lot of regular cultural uh, assets where we could coordinate journeys through those. For example, you'll be hearing from Liftshare later on, that's something they've been pioneering for decades. 100,000 students in Manchester, there's obviously a massive amount of students in, in all of our uh, big cities. Okay, so what can we do around the university sector? What more uh, can we do? Um, team sports, million people across the north every week playing team sports, 100,000 people involved in scouting, 40 million visitors to national parks. What can we do to decarbonize the activities that people are taking part in and how can we connect transport into that? Now, finally, we'll be thinking about issues like the, the, the costs of providing infrastructure and all of the emissions that are involved in building big new infrastructure. There are really big questions about how much travel demand there should be in the future. How much can we afford to accommodate? So uh, work that was done by the Department for Transport looking at potential of automated vehicles and sharing suggested that if people share less when vehicles become automated, we'll have a 55% growth in traffic. If they share more, it could be as low as 5%. That's a huge difference to the amount of infrastructure that we need and all of the emissions that are embodied in that. But it's not just the new infrastructure. We've got 28% of England's minor roads in the north. That's 46,000 miles. So an extra 5 or 55% of traffic makes a huge difference to how much maintenance and upkeep that we need. And that's also a major source of emissions. And of course, it's not just road. TfN's strategic plan for rail is for a spending of somewhere between 60 billion and 100 billion by 2050. And there's a big carbon challenge around the infrastructure involved in building that as well. So there's massive scope for us to be collaborating and working together. So just a little bit about the, uh, who we are uh, and how we're working, uh, how we're organized. So we're coordinated by four overarching research teams. So we have societal acceptance and readiness, which is led by uh, Monica Boucher from Lancaster University. Down here at front, we'll be hearing from her shortly. Uh, Sarah Walker from the University of Newcastle is looking at powering future transport, fuels, and electrification. Uh, and you'll hear from her towards the end of the day. Professor Kevin Anderson, um, who will be on the Carbon Pathway panel here, is leading a theme on uh, carbon target setting. Uh, and uh, Danielle Benzi Tingley, University of Sheffield, looking at these trade offs between demand, futures. Uh, and the emissions involved uh, in construction. And we have a range of uh, collaborators from across the N8 universities. The N8 universities are the eight most research intensive universities in the UK, all performing slightly different roles. Carl Whittle coordinating the research program, uh, Samathia working on our equality and uh, diversity plan, um, Hong Jan Sun from Durham, uh, who's running a big international event for us. Uh, Shona and Tina, you will have heard from uh, through, through our uh, uh, programme organisation. Uh, but finally, I just want to mention our collaboration with the Connected Places Catapult, and you'll hear from uh, Delia on the, on the panel. So this is to try and build in work to actually develop innovation trials. We're already in discussions with one uh, industrial partner, talking to a local authority about what we can do to bring new trials to the north. What, what have we got resources to support? We've got uh, £400,000 worth of funding for research projects for uh, anyone based at UK universities. So whilst we want our platform to be about researching in the north, it's open to all uh, universities in the north and in the UK. So you don't have to be in the NA to participate. You don't have to be in the north to participate. But we would like to see our trials coordinated around activities in the north wherever that is possible. Our first call will be in December, uh, that'll be 100,000, we'll have two further calls. Um, we will be organising uh, research sandpits, um, bid building, consortia meetings uh, with academics, uh, industry, local government. If you've got ideas that you want help with, let us know and we will put things together. And we're also going to use challenge and theme based uh, approach to try and drive uh, forward ideas. Um, we have a stakeholder reference group, uh, and this is a series of meetings from stakeholders right across, we're going to hold them right across uh, the north,
to talk about the challenges of place-based decarbonisation. Uh, so what are the successes, what are the barriers, how do we deal with issues of equity and justice? Uh, just like today, that's going to be a meeting of industry, NGO, local government and academics. And if you want to take part in that, there is a sign up uh, sheet which is available uh, at the front desk. So please do let us know. Uh, we will be running uh, policy cafes, developing policy briefings. You're going to be designing some of those for us this afternoon. What is it that will help make a difference cut through to decision makers or citizens in your areas? Uh, and I've mentioned before, Connected Places, that's what we're working with us on innovation workshops. Just a brief, uh, what's coming up right next. Um, well, there's a, there's a post open for a research fellow to support the network. It closes tomorrow. So if you really like what you heard today and you fancy a complete career change or whatever, you know, get your application in. Um, our funding call launch will be before uh, Christmas, but don't worry, we're not setting a deadline for early in the new year. Uh, it'll be end of January or early February. Um, we have a workshop on the 7th of January, which will be our first uh, research theme workshop, which will be on how we connect carbon targets to action. So again, let us know if you'd like to participate in that. You can sign up through the website. Uh, first stakeholder reference group, 28th of January. Um, we are also looking for an early career research representative, uh, and we'll be advertising for that in the coming month or two. So plenty of opportunities to get involved. But let us know today or after today what you want to see happen, and we'll see what we can do to make that come about. So finally, what will success look like? Well, I've listed a range of outcomes on here, which I think spell out what success will look like at the end of our three years of funding. It's a blend of action, uh, greater funding uh, for the region and deployment of trials. It's new collaborations. It's greater carbon literacy uh, and commitment and an understanding that the North is a great place to come and try out um, decarbonisation innovations. Um, this can't just be a talking shop or just a blue skies discussion, although we hope to have some of both of those. We need action urgently, uh, and we're committed to trying to see that action come about here in the North. We can only do that if we all work together, so it's great to see so many people here today. Thank you very much. Now, we're not going to take uh, questions. We're going to move straight through the presentation and then we'll get into our panel discussion. So, uh, without uh, running over uh, any further, uh, I'll hand over to Lucy Jakes from Transport for the North. Thanks. Hi. <clears throat> Um, so I'm just going to start off and talk a little bit about um, some context to Transport for the North and, and who we are, for those that might not be aware. And then I'll start to talk about um, some of the work that we've been doing in this space and, and what we're going, going to be doing over the next couple of years, really, in this arena. So um, I think the first things to note around um, Transport for the North in itself is um, we are a subnational transport body, so the first of uh, its kind in the UK. Um, and essentially what that means is we act um, between local governments or local partners and national government and we advise around what we think um, the, uh, the strategic pan-northern transport solutions might be or requirements are for the north. Um, a key part of that and, and, and probably what makes our, um, our task quite complex is the area that we represent so uh you know the north is made up of 15 million people um we represent 20 local transport authorities within that there's 73 local authorities so it's a complex geographic social economic and environmental area with lots of different needs and so tfn's role is to try to get those partners to come to a consensus around transport priorities and also what the solutions are for some of our problems Just going to talk a little bit. So one of our key requirements as part of our statutory body status was to establish um, a strategic transport plan that brings together our, our transport priorities um, up to 2050 um, and also starts to map out some of um, some of the schemes that we'd be looking for investment for from central government to improve the transport network in the north. 
Um, so our strategic transport plan was published in uh, February this year, um, and that kind of sets the task really for, for what we're trying to do. I think one of the things that's quite important to note around our strategic transport plan itself, and what I think that makes TFN kind of uh, set apart from traditional transport plans, if you like, is that our transport plan goes that step further. So beyond just thinking about what the transport outcomes and the economic outcomes we would expect to see as a result of transport investment, we also um, think about, and, and within our kind of four key transport objectives, think about well, what, um, you know, social inclusion is right at the heart of what we're trying to do. So actually, how do we ensure access to opportunities for all in the North? How do we make sure that, um, you know, we, we enable quality of life in the North? So thinking about um, place-based place um, outcomes and, and what good quality of life looks like in the North. So how do we maintain our natural assets and make sure that the North is a great place to live and work by 2050 as well? Um, so I think those things are right at the heart of what we're trying to do in our plan. And I think that's what kind of sets TFN apart from perhaps what um, other transport strategies are doing in this space. So a little bit just around um, the challenge, if you like. Um, so some of this I'm sure you're aware of. Um, clearly, uh, the 2018 Paris Climate Agreement collectively committed to limit global average temperature rise to well below two degrees with an ambition um, for the rise to be held below one and a half degrees. So in response to that, the UK government um, committed to net zero greenhouse gas, gas emissions by 2050. Um, our, um, in response to that, a lot of TFM partners and even before that um, have declared uh, climate emergencies across the north which clearly are a failure of the transport investment today and uh, can no longer be ignored. Um, so as a result of that, some of those transport um, climate emergencies that our partners have set go beyond 2050 as well. So timescales for that range from 2030, it was 2040, 2050. And so again, for TFN, that's part of our challenges. What's the right balance um, in terms of TFN's commitment moving forward? Uh, because clearly we have to get consensus between all our partners and what might be right for uh, an urban city region might be completely different to a rural area. So that's one of the challenges we face in the North, um, but we're really trying to move that forward. Um, so aligned to that, within our STP, we're committed to lead the scoping and development of a pathway to 2050, and that's now moved one step further. Um, so we've recently been doing some work with our partners, which has been member-led, to think about um, as part of our corporate plan development for the next five years, what's the role for TFN moving forward? As part of our statutory body, we have a number of powers at the moment, but clearly, um, you know, we are limited in, in, in what we can do. Um, so there's a, a wider piece of work happening at the moment to kind of think about what members want TFN to be over the next five, ten years. Um, and as part of that, there's been a commitment um, to produce a trajectory which enables delivery of an absolute zero carbon transport network before 2050, reflecting on the fact that a lot of those climate emergencies um, our partners have declared come before 2050. So that, I think, is quite a step change because that sets us um, ahead of what UK government is looking to do at this point in time. So again, um, it's, it's positive, but it's also challenging because we don't have... Um, a huge amount of guidance yet from UK government around what their commitments are and, and what the policy framework we're working in looks like. Yeah. Um, so this slide, I just wanted to give a bit of context to, um, again, part of our challenge. Um, so we touched on this a little bit before. So essentially, how are people travelling now in the north? Um, and I think this really kind of sets the scale. So as I mentioned before, the North represents 15 million people. Um, so for context, that's about the same population as the Netherlands. So yes, we are looking at a regional kind of solution here, but essentially, you know, it, it's a huge issue. Um, and in terms of uh, the policy commitment that needs to be made, you know, it, it's quite stark. Um, 
some of the kind of interesting things on here. So 59% of travel all trips in the north at the moment are made by car, 11% by public transport, 90% of car commuting we know has one occupant. Um, you know, uh, there's been an 18% increase in alternative fuel purchases in quarter one 2019, but clearly we're starting from a low base. So as much as there might be a propensity to change, um, there's a huge amount of work to be done to, to shift people's travel behaviour. Um, the next slide illustrates that even further and further kind of sets the scale of our challenge. So um, in 2016, TFM did a piece of work to understand future travel demand and what we think the forecast for that looks like. Um, and at, at the initial piece of work identified that um, by 2050, we would expect to see a 54% increase in road demand and a fourfold increase in rail demand. Um, we're currently in the process of revising um, our forecasts here um, and we're doing a piece of work um, around future uncertainty. So thinking about developing different scenarios, what the future might look like in the north. Um, and a couple of those scenarios are focused around decarbonisation as well. And that piece of work is being led by TFN, um, but also with a number of expert, um, an expert panel to support. So the expert panel pick up areas such as decarbonisation, social change, technological solutions, etc. And Greg actually sits on the panel on our behalf, providing some, some advice into some of these areas that are quite complex. Um, so the outputs of, of, of that current piece of work are expected to complete um, early next year. And what that will do is that will provide us some revised future scenarios around uncertainty that we will then look to kind of feed into our further work. Um, Another couple of things that I think are quite important to mention here in terms of um, some of the different um, modes, if you like. So if you think about road, I think one of the key challenges we have is we need to ensure that we have a joined up um, electric vehicle infrastructure across the north to enable mass adoption. So we need to better understand what that looks like now and what are the challenges and actually what's the infrastructure ask for that moving forward. Similarly, we need to understand how can we ensure a zero carbon public transport network by 2050 so again what infrastructure is needed to help us deliver that and what's the traje trajectory for change um, for those um, for those organizations similarly with rail um, there has been some work done um, so the rail network have established a decarbonization task force which um, had previously produced a couple of reports which identified the removal of diesel passenger trains by 2040 uh, as feasible um, through battery, electric and hydrogen trains, but it did identify that high speed and freight was only credible, uh, was particularly challenging and the only credible alternative to that is electric vehicles. So um, again, another part of the challenge there, um, which has been further accelerated through government's commitment for absolute net zero by 2050. Um, so, you know, what are the solutions there long term? Um, so the rail decarbonisation task force are now um, in the midst of doing some work to produce a map of the UK rail network, which shows which technology should be deployed where and that programme for delivery. Um, and I understand that work's looking to kind of publish something in 2020. So, you know, work is happening across the piece, but Clearly, there's a lot more still to be done. So now I'm just going to briefly talk through quite high level some work that TFN has been doing in this space to build on um, our commitment in the STP to develop the pathway to 2050 for the North and to understand what that looks like. So just briefly in terms of our work to date. Um, so we've done, a, uh, you know, quite a few things I would say over the last 18 months really and there's definitely been a step change at TFN and with our partners around the momentum for making this a key priority within our workloads. Um, so one of the key pieces of, of, of work that we have done or the commitments we've made is we've commissioned some external environmental expertise um, through Temple Group to support our work in this area and develop our thinking. Um, and as part of that work, they've um, undertaken a policy and technical stock take for us, which includes review 
reviewing current innovative work and carbon budgets, um, looking at work of a number of our partners, what they're doing, and start to build some case studies of what's going on so far, looking at what central government have committed through different policies that have been announced. Um, and then also, in terms of the technical stock take, looking at what other areas have done in this space um, and, and trying to identify you know, next steps for TFN in terms of developing our pathway. Um, they've also um, produced a series of briefing notes um, covering four distinct key decarbonisation evidence stages, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more on the next slide. Um, but essentially, this is how we develop the pathway um, with a number of recommendations for TFN and our partners to discuss and consider moving forward. Um, and then we've also been doing some other work, um, as Greg mentioned earlier. So TFN um, has a number of um, data and analytical kind of tools um, at our disposal. So we've been doing a lot of work to further develop those um, and to feed into um, the future transport demand scenarios as well. So identifying how do we embed different future scenarios into our transport models to help us um, map out what this trajectory looks like and help us understand that kind of scale of change as it comes about. And then finally as well, as I mentioned before, we have now committed with our partners to producing a trajectory to deliver absolute net zero before 2050. Um, so again, moving forward over the coming months, we need to work through um, how we work through with our partners, how we better define that target. So actually what target date are we setting on that? And clearly that will be quite a lengthy uh, kind of governance process because as I mentioned, some partners have declared that climate emergency to 2030, others are at 2050. And we need to make sure that, you know, TFN, while being um, aspirational and, you know, wanting to set the pace for change, that we're making sure that that's kind of representative of where our partners are at across the North. Um, okay, so just a little bit in terms of developing the pathway and what that looks like. Um, so again, this has mainly been led by um, some consultants who've done some work for us at Temple. Um, um, uh, I believe Ross is gonna sit on the panel if there's any more technical questions about this. But just high level, so there's a couple of different steps in terms of how we develop the pathway. And the first step um, and the starting point for this is the historic emissions inventory. So what we need to establish is a method that can be periodically updated. So um, how, do we, how do we gather that? Essentially, this is the core evidence component for tracking progress towards our target. Um, and it's linked to our analytical framework, so it's linked to our transport models as well, and it'll feed into um, so the outputs um, to calculate fleet emissions and travel demand will sit within our transport models, um, which can then be processed into greenhouse gas emissions uh, calculations. Um, so that's kind of the starting point for the pathway, really. Um, the next step clearly is um, the baseline, so what's our reference case, what's our business as usual, and again this will be linked to um, different contextual factors actually, so what does population change look like, um, different population changes and how will that affect it, how do different rates of economic growth impact um, the trajectory, fuel prices etc, there's a number of different kinds of factors that feed into the reference case that that will help us kind of map out how this might change over time. And again, it links to those scenarios, those future scenarios, which is currently being undertaken at the moment. So that's really critical to help us understand the different baselines and, and start to think about what the trajectories are. Um, so the third step clearly is the pathway. So um, it's not, and I think the really important thing here is clearly it's not about the end point, but actually it's that trajectory for change and how do we get there and how, how fast is that? rate of change um, so again you know, TFN seeking some external advice to um, help us identify our approach and decisions towards setting that pathway and that will be a key part of our work over the next year really and then finally as well um, the other elements to this piece of work is clearly there's a piece around policy analysis so actually um, what are the cumulative effects of emissions reduction 
um, and what are the existing policies to support, etc. And finally, there's a gap analysis as well, which I don't think is covered in there. Oh yeah, it is. Um, so clearly, um, you know, once we've kind of identified the trajectory, we've looked at what policies exist at the moment. Clearly, there's a, a misalignment at the moment between, um, you know, what the ambition is, and actually, you know, there are some policies out there, but there's not a huge amount of detail in how we take this forward at the moment. So it's that policy framework, that gap analysis, which is going to be really critical to actually making sure we deliver on this, um, and it's not just kind of a sound bite. Um, so finally, I just uh, yeah, so finally, just wanted to quickly run through some of our next steps. Um, so clearly, this is a work in progress. Uh, there's a lot more still to be done here. Um, so in terms of our next steps, so the first thing is those future scenarios, so making sure they align to decarbonisation analysis, um, which is ongoing at the moment. Um, second to that, um, next year in our business plan, we're looking to model the series of trajectories of the pathway to 2050. Um, based on the outcomes of those future scenarios. Um, and then once that's been identified, once those pathways have been identified, there's clearly a, a, a huge amount of work required to determine the functional policy framework for delivery, which is particularly complex due to the pestle factors. So, um, and also the lack of central government policy. So how much of this can be, how much of this is determined by national policy? How much of it is local policy? how much of it is within TFN's sphere of influence, given traditionally we're working in, we're looking at pan-northern journeys, which typically are kind of 15 miles or more. So it's from local authority to local authority. So what are the solutions at all of those different levels? And that all needs a lot more work um, by ourselves and partners. Um, and then I think the other critical thing to kind of identify on here as well is next year, um, in the next financial year, we're committing to publishing decarbonisation strategy alongside um, our revised investment programme. Um, so that will summarise our work today, the trajectories, our thinking and the next steps as well. Um, and then the final slide, I recognise I'm running out of time, um, but just the final slide to kind of just as a bit of a, maybe it'll spark some of the discussion of the panel session really, but just a question around how decarbonate can maybe support TFN in our work in this space. Um, so clearly there's lots of, it's a big task, there's a big challenge, lots of questions that we don't know the answer to, national government don't know the answer to, globally people don't know the answer to. So clearly collaboration is the key to this, um, utilising expertise from a range of different sectors, academics, etc. will really help us move our thinking forward. Um, so key questions here to the network would be how, how can the network support us identifying that decarbonisation pathway? Um, how can we use the network and um, the members within it to better understand what the technological and social change uh, that's required will be? Um, you know, is there expertise in the network that can support us with data mining to better understand the current picture in the north across a range of different areas? Um, and also, I think a really key one for us is around building relationships. Um, so clearly, TFN has really strong relationships with our partners, so the local authorities, DFT, Highways England, etc., but not particularly um, great relationships at present with electricity, technology providers, etc. So hopefully the network can help us um, link with those types of organisations again, because a lot of the solutions to some of this might come from 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 those um, those leaders, really. Um, that's it. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'd like to invite the four panellists uh, to join us. So we're going to change now to you doing uh, more of the talking. Uh, so it'll be a, a, a Q&A. So uh, we've got Kevin Anderson, Professor of Energy and Climate Change at the University of Manchester and Uppsala University. Uh, Ewa Kmietovic, from, who's the team leader of Transport and Land Use Mitigation, Committee on Climate Change, to come have a seat. Delia Dimitriou, who's the Strategic Development Director for the R&D programme, the Connected Places Capital. And Ross Hunter, who you just heard uh, mentioned, who's uh, Senior Technical Director at Temple Group and has been helping transport for the North. Yeah, it's a bit tight there. So what we're going to do is, um, I've just, like, 
no more than no more than brief introductory remarks from uh, from the panelists. Then we're going to go straight to uh, questions from the floor. I'm going to take them in groups of three. Uh, please make them short questions, not uh, long uh, diatribes. Uh, and then we'll get some feedback from the panel. So hopefully we can get a few rounds uh, of questions in. So, um, well, let's start start with uh, Kevin at the uh, at the end. Do you want to make any introductory sure. remarks, or are you happy to go straight to Q and A? Which is your preference? Uh, well, we're we're short on time. I think maybe it'd be nice to go to to, to, to Q and A. So, okay, okay let's take some questions from the floor. Have we got a roving Someone mic? Okay, so that one's roving. Uh, Obviously, people won't be able to see you if you're um, sat down. So if you're speaking you, and you can actually stand up in the space that's available <laughs> to you, then that might be the, the way forward. OK, so we've got a question here, and we've got one here, and then one over there. So we'll take these three uh, as our first set of questions. Thank you. It's Nina Smith, Chair of Rail Future Yorkshire. I think we need to be talking much more about modal shift than simply about replacing petrol and diesel cars with electric vehicles. There's still a lot of issues with electric vehicles to do with pollution, both in terms of production, uh, in terms of the batteries and what they contain, and in terms of the particulates that they do. But I think we really need to be concentrating on spending a lot of money on high quality public transport systems, including uh, a tram system for Leeds and West Yorkshire, a much more effective um, regional rail and commuter rail services. Okay, so a question on ambition on, on mode shift. Okay, we've got one here. Thank you. Uh, Paul Owen, some of the city council. Um, just a question certainly regarding transport to the north and obviously uh, what they're planning and what they're going through there, which I think is great and it's valuable. And uh, I don't know from Sunday's perspective, we're spending a lot of time at the moment trying to determine our baseline and where how we're going to get there. But as well as that, it possibly needs some more than just the baseline analysis. There has to be more twin track, triple track uh, measures that could be in place now rather than just waiting until we've done all the analysis and we've got the data to say, all oh, right, well, we need to have a 10% reduction this year, just to make it simple. There are things we can be doing now, and this should be a high priority. Okay, so I think that's an important one on the short term, uh, as well as the longer term uh, side of things. Yeah, we've got one over there. Hi, uh, Andy Shirley from Cal International. All this discussion about how we take carbon out and the research and so on and so forth is all very valid and very important. But it's important to get it into market and we deliver that quickly once the research advances. So what work's being done with the engagement into the groups and bodies and organisations that can actually get this technology, whatever it will be, into market? Okay, well, I'm, I'm particularly looking at uh, Delia to, to, to pick up on that. They're on the category. Okay, so uh, who, who would like to start and where would you like to start? We don't uh, we'll have to answer all of those. I think we'll, we'll run out of time, but pick, pick, uh, pick a favourite. Uh, do you want to go first, Amy? Okay. okay. I'll say a bit about... Hello? Yes, it's working. <laughs> you have to keep it fairly close. Okay, I'll say a bit about the first question, which was around modal shift. Um, I think that's a really important question and um, something that we've been trying to incorporate into our uh, deep emission reduction scenarios for transport. So the way we approach it is quite sort of stylized at the moment. So we look at different modes of, of transport like cars, HGVs and aviation and see how much, have a look at the evidence and see how much can be shifted into other modes. So for passenger cars, for example, we look at the potential for, for switching probably the easiest journeys, which tend to be the shortest journeys, into cycling, public transport and walking, and what the associated policies are needed to deliver that. And I think our, in terms of our ambition so far, it's quite limited on the demand side, and um, we'll be publishing a new report next year, which will look at um, pathways up to the sixth carbon budget period, which is the mid-2030s. And one of the scenarios that we're planning to publish for that is a deep behaviour change scenario. So we'll, we'll hopefully be doing a lot more on that side for, for that analysis. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'll quickly whip through, through those. The modal shift, I think that is obviously absolutely key. But I think the thing we always talk, we don't, well, the thing we never talk about is actually just doing less. It's not just about 
shifting to another mode, but actually doing less travel or different forms of travel or going away for longer or changing our schedules, not just about switching between modes. I also think in this, we have to start to think what fits well with our with our um, physical built environment. So I'm not a great fan of EVs within cities, for instance. Why are we still gonna move around, in my case, 84 kilograms of flesh with 2000 kilograms of metal, just a few kilometers. So perhaps electric bikes, public transport, walking, replanning our cities and our urban environments to not be using cars, but then maybe, in fact, the charging structure perhaps for EVs would be much more appropriate in the rural environment, which sometimes is a, is a much better place. We have much lower load factors and cars may be better than buses in those, those sort of environments. In terms of um, the policies in place now, that is again absolutely key. And in fact, one of the issues about that is that we, to, the main policies there need to be about driving our behavioural shift rather than just the technologies, because we cannot make major shifts in the technologies that will drive the emissions down in the very near term, in the one to three year time frame. So I would argue we need about 30% reduction in emissions from, from the transport network within about um, three years to meet our Paris, to, to be online with our Paris commitments. Um, but we're not going to do that through tech. So I think there we have to really think what are the behavioural uh, 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 policies we put in place. And they need to embed absolutely their core issues of equity because very few of the emissions um, come from the relatively poor and median people. They come from the relatively wealthy people. And it's that group we need to drive the emissions out of. And in terms of what the, uh, how do we take this to market, I'm a great fan of standards, actually, rather than prices. Set the standards and the markets are very good at delivering to those. But those standards need to be incredibly tight if we're to deliver on Paris. Oh, um, so um, I will talk about uh, how uh, the power of this network to shape the market, the transport market. What's going on now at UN level? Transport is the only sector that will not meet the Paris Agreement. So there is room to shape through different innovations and in implementations how to decarbonize transport. And I will give you an example how TFN via TFGM was brought in Washington in 2016 as part of an EU-US cooperation program on decarbonizing transport for a sustainable future. Uh, I'm from Manchester, so I know better what uh, uh, Transport for Greater Manchester is doing. Uh, I admire them for pushing the research uh, through innovation. Um, so by that time, the presentation from uh, TFGM and presenting for also uh, TFN was going beyond the vehicle technologies. And the example that the uh, Transport for Greater Manchester gave in uh, Washington was rural mobility, uh, new services linked to uh, and right, and how um, the local authority can shape research within the community. As an academic myself, I was extremely happy and pleased to see how important the information uh, is when it comes from a, a local authority from a, a government perspective. So um, our role as Catapult will be to bring this network via innovations to scaling up into demonstrators and also to have our place in, uh, at the global level. And I can uh, also mention the uh, Marrakesh Partnership for Climate Action. We can shape our role there and also uh, next year Conference of parties will be in Glasgow. So let's shape these ambitions as well. Thank you. Great. Okay, uh, just to pick up on the, the first point around the ambition for modal shift. Yes, that's definitely one I, I very much agree with Kevin. There was something that was mentioned there with regards to co-benefits with air quality. That's really important when we look at electric vehicles and fine particulates. Already by 2020, 50% of road transport emissions of fine particles are coming from the tyres, the brakes and resuspension of particles going up to 75% by 2025. So clearly the air quality problem, that co-benefit isn't necessarily going away. So we need to reduce those vehicle kilometres. Um, coming on to the question around TFN and some of the work uh, that, that we've done with TFN, I think there's a couple of aspects to this in terms of, yes, I would completely agree about um, getting action in now, and that's part of the work that's been done. Um, there's a lot of work going on in regards to the big investment programme that TFN had, and some of the work that we did was looking about how can the decarbonisation part of that decision-making process be much more up up pipeline much more upstream so the, the initial design phase of some of that work and that's something that will hopefully come online sooner rather than later 
also to mention this work has been quick and it's going to be quick towards the what do we do next and then the final quick point to mention around that is that you do need to understand your scope you need to understand what you're acting on you need to understand your policy drivers hence the importance of, the, of something like the greenhouse gas inventory mm -hmm. and making that specific to tfn's remit Great, thanks. And we'll take another bank of three questions. I think I'll just add to Andy's question that in the room we've got people who've got challenges. They're the, the deployment environments in which we need these technologies to be deployed. We've got some technology companies and industry bodies. You know, let's be designing those trials together so that we do the learning and then we get the deployment here in the north. Okay, uh, we'll take some from over here. So. Uh, Let's start the lady over there. Uh, let's do yeah, three plus the best. I'm going to jump over you. Great. So uh, it's quite tight in here, isn't it? <laughs> 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 uh, hiya, Lucy from Zero Carbon Yorkshire. I just wondered if the um, necessary conversations are having with ha uh, happening with the airports, because as we know, you know. There's lots of expansion talk on the table, which to me seems absolutely crazy that it shouldn't even be on the table. And I wondered if the figures are now reflecting um, the, the carbon that's coming from the airports and the flights, and whether this, you know, this is a huge thing, and they should be bringing these levels down rather than, than you know, more flying. And I just wondered if this is being addressed, because to me that's a really massive issue. Great, thanks. And we have two more in the nearby vicinity. Hi, I'm Rachel Brinson from Steer. Um, just, I mean, first of all, it's fantastic to see how much activity is already going on um, following the uh, net zero commitment. But one thing that we, yeah, you know, it's really important we don't forget is that climate is already changing and will continue to change regardless of how much we cut emissions. And just how much, with the sort of route ways to decarbonisation, we can actually look at a route way to carbon resilience as well, and look at, sorry, climate resilience. And then we're looking at the impacts. Uh, um, adapted impact at the same time. Um, Alice Goatride, freelance, working mainly in national parks and rural areas. Um, with behaviour change and technological solutions being either too slow or too small, when will private car use restriction become politically acceptable and is it something that we need to do at the regional spatial scale rather than just locally? And I say this because we you know it, it's called pedestrianisation of urban centres, but it's now openly being discussed in rural areas and especially in national parks. So is it inevitable that we're going to have to tackle it and when will it be completely acceptable to do so? Good. Who would like to go first off that and certain questions? Okay, we're good. Okay. So I will talk about uh, airport. Uh, so aviation integration into the transport system. Here, there's a problem worldwide uh, because aviation was always perceived and uh, the business that they were doing was uh, in isolation. We're talking about airport, local air quality, not integrating with the motorways around the airport. Now, the push from IKEA, so the UN organization on aviation, is to integrate aviation within transport sector. And I had in mind exactly the, the missing link for decarbonate how can we have a case study, Leeds plus the airport, or even uh, Liverpool, port, airport, and uh, urban mobility and rural mobility? So then we can integrate everything together. Uh, our uh, topic, for instance, in Catapult is now to uh, work on low carbon integration um, uh, uh, urban mobility. We consider also urban air mobility. So air taxes, this is the future, but we have to consider as well. So the missing link is integration. And because now it's coming from IKEA, because aviation is under pressure to deliver and to uh, commit to some uh, reduction of uh, CO2, um, it's time for us also to go towards them. Thank you. Okay, who wants to go next? Yeah. Yes, just to quickly pick up on the airports issue and related to that international question, um, that that's very much something which is separated. I and mean, if we look at the international level and hence what the UK reports internationally on the aviation front, it's split into international and domestic. Um, so the domestic comes into the, the uh, proportion that's 
reported, the international is reported as a memo item. So it's reported as a separate bit and that's being handled by ICAO as an international process. So there's, a, there's an aspect of looking at that domestic portion as well. You can also further split it down when we look at emissions um, from, from airports. There's also the, the ground emissions as well, which is substantial and there's a real potential opportunity to really drive that down going forward as well. Um, so there is definitely opportunities to work with the airports going forward, I think. Um, with regard to the climate resilience, resilience question, that's, yeah, that's very important. Um, and that's something where I think, again, you look at policies and you look at dual benefits and there's a lot of lessons to be learned um, there from when we look at the international level and particularly when we look at our developing nations who tend to approach mitigation as mitigation through adaptation uh, because that's extremely important they're focused on ad adapting so hence policies tend to focus on what are the win-wins and that's definitely a lesson that we can learn and take into some of the work that's done and scaled down to the to the level of decarbonate So um, aviation, yes, absolutely, that needs to be in our targets and it's in the net zero target. We've got a trajectory for reducing aviation emissions and that involves the sector actually taking um, action and not just offsetting their emissions. So have a look at that in our scenarios if you're interested. On the climate resilience point, yes, agree, that's absolutely fundamental too. I cover land use as well. And that's a, a sector where there's so many synergies and co-benefits of action on climate mitigation and resilience. And we'll be producing a report on land use later in the year. So take um, have a look at that as well. It's, it's not really transport related, but it's around agriculture and land use. In terms of private car restriction, I think that's really tricky tricky point. And, and perhaps that's easier done at the local level than it is at the national level. If you look at the example of the congestion charge in London, I don't think um, a national government would support such a thing, but it was managed to be implemented through the GLA. So I think that's a, a really sort of good test um, case for, for action that can go faster at the, at the regional and local level than at the national level, and that can drive change at the national level. Um, I'll caveat everything I'm about to say um, that I think we should deliver we're committed to the Paris Agreement. So assuming we are going to deliver the Paris Agreement and we're going to go for real zero, not some mythical net zero. Remember, net is Latin for pass the buck to our children. Um, so real zero, not and that makes a big difference when you play out the carbon budget. In terms of airports, if you follow the Committee on Climate Change's aviation pathway, that represents about 40% of the UK's fair carbon budget. I would disagree very strongly with the CCC's carbon budget because it's premised on lots of negative emission technologies. If you play out a fair version of the Paris Agreement, so aviation in the UK is planned to be 40%. That single sector, remember that 70% of the flights are carried out by 15% of the people in the UK. And in any one year, 50% of the people in the UK do not fly. So it is, it is highly um, inequitable that we are dominating, or that aviation is gonna dominate the emissions from this particular sector. So we have to very severely look at containing aviation flight, particularly for the frequent flyers, because they're the ones that drive aviation, not the occasional family flight of Benidorm that we always blame. So it's the frequent flyers. We know who they are, because we see them when we uh, shave or put on makeup on. Um, <laughs> when it comes to the issue about climate resilience, I think that's absolutely key. And I would add it's additionally key because the next set of reports from the IPCC, which are probably going to come out in 2021, 2022 time, AR6, Assessment Report 6, the early signs are that the climate sensitivity, for those aren't climate geeks, that means the amount of temperature change that we're going to get for any amount of carbon dioxide we put in the atmosphere, looks like it's going to increase very significantly. I mean, it looks, at the moment, it looks like we've got a hell of a handcart. So it's going to, and that will mean that, in fact, the carbon budgets are completely slashed from what they are today. So resilience is absolutely key because it looks like we're not going to be aiming for two. We may be aiming for three or four, the way that the uh, science is going, because the feedbacks that aren't in the original um, earlier models. Um, when it comes to uh, the national parks, I had this discussion in Snowdonia quite a few years ago, actually, at the, uh, at the the, every year there's a big festival in Snowdonia about, uh, um, for climbers and mountaineers. And I suggested then that we stopped, started to ban cars from Snowdonia. It went down like a lead balloon by the, uh, with most of the sort of local communities, the local shops. We said we need to bring people in. So we need to find some way to balance that between the communities in these particularly national parks. I'm all for trying to stop as many cars as we can. 
Um, but I think we need to find some way to balance the demands of the communities or requirements of the communities there for the tourist revenue and actually um, trying to get people in there. So I think that's a, it's a difficult one to balance, but I think it's key that we have to start to address that. And ultimately, this will be come down to restrictions. Um, but there's no neat way out of these things. We're going to have to constrain people's activities if we are to um, curtail our missions in line with Paris. Okay. Um, promise you that we wouldn't always have um, comfortable discussions and come and set out some of the tensions and, and, and you know, the, the real issues we face. A really good question on, on resilience investment. Yep. That's money that we're currently anticipating we're going to be spending on, on network growth. So, you know, Can I just add something? No, because we're, we're, we're really short on time. We've got one live stream question. So just okay. so that we can uh, you know, make sure those people who are watching on live stream get, get, get a satisfaction. So Absolutely. We've got a question from David Tidefield who says he completely agrees with Kevin about the need to reduce mobility, not just electrify it. Uh, how, though, does this fit with the important ambition to make the North an attractive place for innovation and mobility? What needs to change for this square circle to be squared? And what can decarbonate do on that? Okay, so chance for a final reflective uh, thought from, from, from the panel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, any time to think about that. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I... One of the big problems of the north, obviously, is congestion. That is not attractive to people from outside and as businesses and industries wanted to move here. So we can find ways to eliminate congestion or to massively reduce it. And they may, that may mean a lot of the time, are there ways that we can, we can develop virtual forms of communication that actually work, not some sort of Sky and all these other, uh, uh, Skype and so forth, which are always still at the moment really, really inadequate. So we need to develop much, much better virtual ways of communicating, and that hopefully could tell some of our congestion. But then obviously we do need a, a, a much richer uh, public transport infrastructure. I mean, I, I came over this today from the Peak District, and the, the, you know, it, it's old train followed by old train if it's on time. Um, you know, th this is 2019, so we need to be investing in this sort of infrastructure, but that will take time. Um, so the two areas there, public transport, really key, and the second one is um, on virtual communication. I also add, I think we need to really address freight. In the North thing is terrible for freight. So we need to maybe re rethink things like things that are thought to be unthinkable, like opening the Longwoodale um, tunnel again, you know, reopening things that Victorians managed to do that we need to say we can't do nowadays. Um, so that might help with the freight issues. Um, so I think the question was around um, how we reduce mobility and how that squares with innovation. And I don't think those two things are mutually exclusive. I think you can have both of them at the same time. And uh, some of the things that Kevin was talking about, obviously, are really essential. Innovation in, in EV battery technology, storage, vehicle to grid technologies, they're all key part of this um, story, irrespective of what level of demand that you have. Uh, I agree with um, Kevin about congestions and air quality, the problem in the north. So I invite... Uh, you to our uh, workshop on innovation, um, uh, the, identifying the environmental innovation in, in the north. Um, we, we may tackle um, learning by doing, so looking for some successful um, regions yeah, to implement uh, decarbonizing transport and implement this, transfer the knowledge in the north. So I have a proposal for uh, decarbonizing M62 from port to port, so probably we will uh, discuss this afternoon or with another occasion, and agree with the freight. This is a real problem because 90% of the goods on M62 is on freight. And I know that as part of this EPSRC uh, network plus, we have a network on freight, but this is run by London. So we have to focus in the north and uh, to find some clever solutions to uh, Export them in the, uh, in the other parts of UK. Okay, just to finish off, hopefully to end on a perhaps a bit more of a positive note as well. And looking at this from the, the TFN perspective, obviously TFN is a relatively young organisation. It gives a rather unique opportunity to address this issue of transport, um, greenhouse gas emissions in the north. It, it's one which is looking for high ambition, certainly versus the rest of the UK. And also when you look internationally, and it's a relatively blank canvas at the moment. And that canvas is wanting to be um, have writing on it very, very quickly. So there's chance for action, real action very soon. 
and, and TFN has huge influence to change the transport infrastructure, tra transport, be transport behavior, and as a result, greenhouse gas emissions from transport in the north. Switching to the final part of the question around decarbonate, well, there's a huge amount of expertise in this room and within the decarbonate network, and a huge amount of experience and knowledge that can feed into TFN. And I, I don't think I speak um, out of turn with TFN when I say that they're extremely hungry for that kind of advice and expertise to be fed in to shape some of these uh, policies and some of these uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction measures going forward. Great. Uh, join me in thanking the panel. For <laughs> Brett, if I could ask you to try and squeeze out of that. Uh, we're going to move straight on to two more uh, presentations. So, um, we're going to switch more into a kind of uh, place-based focus. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, Ian Palmer, who's the head of uh, strategic modeling and analysis. Is that right? Well, not close enough. But uh, for Greater Manchester, he's going to talk about the. Uh, yeah, you need to just um, pop this mic. Uh, going to talk a little bit about the work they've been doing in uh, Greater Manchester around their 2040 strategy. Uh, good morning. Is the fire alarm going to go off? Uh, yeah. Well, we'll talk. Talk. Okay, Actually. right. I'll try and do this really quick then, and, uh, and I'll get off. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad that uh, we've already covered uh, congestion charging and aviation emissions, so obviously any questions I'll get will be really easy. Uh, but also, I think I've learned quite a lot already, which is highlighted as a, a transport planner who's now the wrong side of 50. Uh, I've got a lot to learn, uh, and maybe the future generations will suffer from my inaction. Uh, Greater Manchester's done quite a lot over the last few years in terms of trying to create an integrated strategic planning framework to try and bring these different sectors together uh, that clearly will be needed to try and solve the carbon problem. I think we've all been trying to solve different problems, uh, but also this, I think, integration of strategic planning is needed and covers quite a lot of the issues that have already been raised this morning. Uh, transport is but one part of that, uh, and we all sit under the Greater Manchester strategy. Uh, but this integration takes a lot of time. So one of the words I heard Greg said this morning was this network from decarbonate is going to be rapid, uh, and we all need to, as I need to wake up, we all need to wake up and move from this strategic planning level, which I think is vital, so we are tackling the big issues in an integrated way, but then get down to the level of to prioritizing action and then actually getting on and doing things. So that's so something I've been picking up today. So in terms of that integrated planning journey, these are the 10 themes of the Great Manchester strategy. And we've been working on this for over a decade now, informed, and it's quite important, largely by the greater the, the Manchester Independent Economic Review, and more recently, our Prosperity Review. Uh, and this integrated planning tends not to be informed by a sort of environmental agenda. And maybe when I started, I'd only read these documents and the 10 areas, number five is transport, that's what I'm doing, straight in there, I'm just gonna look at that transport bit. Don't, I don't even read the exec summary, just read chapter five and off we go. Uh, but more recently, the place, and this is why I think decarbonates focus on a place-based agenda, is charmed with what we've been trying to do uh, in Greater Manchester. And as people from different sectors try to look at what does the place need, and then you have to, unfortunately, read all 10 chapters and try and think about that. So I'm learning things this morning. So in that integrated place-based sort of way, maybe three, four, uh, two or three years ago now, we launched our revised local transport plan. We didn't call it a local transport plan, we called it 2040, a strategy. And at the heart of it, we've tried to pick up some of what is the sustainable transport that is needed for the future. And we set ourselves a target, it's all about targets, but minor transport targets, not, not carbon targets. So that's an interesting point I hope we'll come back to. So we set out and said, right, we want to try and make 50% of our journeys in the future sustainable. And that means we're gonna to have to hold cars and car trips at least to the level they are today. And we're all very nervous about that. Uh, and I think 
on reflection, the world's kind of overtaken us a bit. Uh, and this now tends to look a bit tame, but I'll just talk a bit more about it. Uh, and so we have this, it's in white, you can't really read it. So one million more sustainable journeys. Uh, and we try to look at, not, so uh, Greg introduced me as a modeler, I'm more of a, a lapsed modeler or an ex-modeler uh, because I've gone out of business now. So rather than predict and provide, we try to move to a, a vision and validate. So what do, what's the world really that we want to look like in 2040? And then how do we get there? So this idea of setting a, a vision, a target, place we want to be, <coughs> and then set our, our pathway, the word from, from earlier on. Um, but to bring in that, initially as a transport planner, I'd look at it at, at a modal level. What does that mean for cars? What does that mean for buses and trains, etc.? But increasingly, we try to get people to think about the place dimension. So in our transport strategy, we introduced spatial themes. So, so what does this strategy mean for, coming from the outside in, for, from the neighbourhoods, the small trips, the local area? What does it mean for travelling around our city region? How do we get from places to places? There's quite a lot of traffic and activity. Activity, let's not talk about traffic, activity that's in the regional centre. So how do you get to the regional centre? And then maybe getting into more the spaces of TFN uh, and the, our, our access to the to the world to the globe. So we said, how do we can think about that? So we then tried to break down our that fifty percent sustainable journeys by twenty forty by those spatial themes and by modes. So people talked before about uh, what does it mean for modes, but also what does it mean for places. So key local neighbourhood trips here. There's awful, when you look at a trip base, there's so much more activity. This is very short. And if one of my colleagues here, they explain exactly which the definitions of these categories are. But this is sort of two, three kilometre trips in the local area. And it's really surprising when you show it on a trip basis, how much the trip making is local. And then, but there's still a chunk of car travel. <laughs> and then to the retail centre, maybe the, the, where we focus an awful lot of our time, because that's where public transport is good. And well, it's got a competitive advantage. But again, a sort of reasonable set of trip making, and maybe on a modal basis, we're not doing too bad. Uh, and our economic ambitions are pushing more traffic into the into the city centre. But this is the sort of big target area. You know, look at how much travel goes in and around the wide city region, and how how car based that is. But I want to turn that on this, this morning's conversations into a carbon challenge. How do I move away from thinking about traffic and trips into into a carbon one? So that's what one area. Another area that I've been involved with uh, is for most, you get those strategies in place and then it's all about the big budgets. It's about capital investment. Uh, and currently the two uh, main political parties are, are again, going to keep me in a job until I retire. So how do I go to prioritize all that capital investment they're sending through? And I just kind of reflected on how we've done that in the past. So. So there's about 10 or 12 uh, city regions, uh, city deals, sort of 2010, 11, 12, 13, set investment funds uh, that were trying to work with government to put more money in, raise money a bit locally, but how do we spend the big money at, at a local level? I mean, it's not big money compared to Network Rail and Harvey's England, but we'll come back to them maybe. Uh, and so I was just reflecting on how we in Greater Manchester had set our, our the, the prioritisation. And we were all about, maybe because we did it when we just had a recession, but it was all about the economy, stupid. So we want to maximise GVA. We want to build our economy. Uh, and we set ourselves a framework. But we also thought, well, we'd have to think about inclusion. So Kevin from Manchester Uni was there talking about, you know, different elements of society and, and sort of travel poverty. So we wanted to have a little dimension about that. Uh, and we also knew, even then, about 10 years ago, that carbon was an issue. But we set ourselves this really strong target of making sure that we were uh, no worse off uh, in, in, in our prioritisation. And other cities, so Glasgow, so I should say Glasgow and the Clyde Valley, uh, and here in West Yorkshire, uh, also set out to do these transport funds. Glasgow and the Clyde Valley was also looking at regeneration and flood defences. They were a bit, they moved things on a little bit, they were a bit more integrated. But again, it was all about the economy. Uh, it's something to say GM, sorry. Uh, it was maximising our economy for how much money we were putting in. But again, carbon, for those two programmes, was, I think this is my phrase, not theirs, but it was an aspiration. 
we'll try and do something. So to me, addressing carbon, decarbonate, how do we, because this is all coming back again now, cities, city regions are going to be setting prioritisation exercises of how they spend big capital money. So we want those integrated transport networks that help places that link to activity. We need to change the dimensions of this exercise. So how do we bring carbon from the bottom higher up? We also talked before about innovation, uh, new mobility, uh, and currently uh, Great Manchester has a bid in for the, so that's right in the bottom to be uh, the future mobility zone bid uh, process with, with, with the department. Uh, and hopefully after the election, uh, we'll hear about where that's got to. Uh, I'm trying to build on that strategy of reducing, uh, getting down to 50% sustainable journeys. We are looking to set up different places and how do things like mobility as a service work in a sustainable carbon reduction way in different places in, within Great Manchester? So that maps a bit poor, but that's very poor. <laughs> Basically, the three areas are uh, Bolton and Berry, up in the north of, of our conurbation, uh, looking at sort of semi-rural areas, but also into, into town centres that to get that level of uh, trick movement into the sort of more sustainable journeys basis we need to get those town centers to, to thrive we've got one base around the regional center because that's our growth area of travel we're going to hold car constant so how does mobility as a service help us do that uh, and i said i wouldn't talk about airports but the third one is in and around the airport so we have a enterprise zone based at the airport uh, and lots of activity kind of growing around there how do we do that in a more sustainable way I thought I was going to get uh, five minutes. Yeah, and obviously the fire alarm's not working, so I don't know if I'm going to say right. or not. <laughs> well, I've kind of raced through that thinking I was going to get killed. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think, shall I just re recap? It's slightly slower. Uh, so I think what we've tried to do is work at a number of levels. So one is an integrated strategic planning level of how the big decisions are made and not made in, in the silos uh, in terms of transport. We've increasingly tried to link it to an economic plan. We now have a five-year uh, environment plan in that suite of documents. Uh, nine of the 10 authorities in Great Manchester have declared a climate emergency. And we are our, our figure is we want to go carbon neutral by, I'm not sure if it's net or uh, the, the proper one, Kevin might be able to tell me, uh, by 2038. Real. Real, okay. But to me, so that, you can see how I'm struggling in there, that's a new language for me as a transport planner. So a forum and network like this to educate me, but I can bring my problems and hopefully learn from different sectors, it is really needed. Uh, in terms of that prioritization exercise I showed you, that, that, that's really important. I think we've been trying to work with uh, central government and the treasury for about three years now to try and get a, the next form of these transport funds. It's the next iteration of, of devolution. Uh, and it's really important that we get the scope for that right. So at the moment, we're looking at bringing transport together with housing and growth areas uh, and also uh, decarbonizing the public estate. Don't ask me what that means. But that's the third element of our portfolio. So that latest prioritization challenge of looking for billions of pounds uh, is trying to bring those three areas together. Uh, so how do we set that challenge? And we certainly can't set that challenge if on the slide where I had the three previous sort of incarnations that we took very locally to have carbon at the bottom. So how do we begin to try and talk about with politicians and senior, senior officers about, a, and they're going to see it as a trade-off. I've got to trade off uh, decarbonisation against economic growth. And once a conversation is stuck into that uh, nub, I think it'd be very hard hard to break. So how do we change that conversation to try and meet the aspirations of, of green growth, of good growth? Uh, and then in terms of the uh, transport vision and validate, the traffic numbers, uh, in terms of the trips and traffic, going back to the conversation that we had before, to make that vision reality, we've done some work that said, with standard sort of uh, parameters in my own my models, 
how much of that can we going to do? Mm, not much, not much, because a lot of it is about changing perceptions and the quality of the local environment. So not only is it transport supply, it's not if we only had all the money from that big investment fund to change public transport, everything would be okay. We also need a healthy dose of behavioural change we're talking about in terms of how people perceive travel, how they make their choices. But we also need a big dose of, of a land use change. So we need to make our, our outlying towns, uh, our sort of city centres, city centres also the outlying towns and the local neighbourhoods, attractive places that people want to go to. So it's not just a modal shift, so you don't drive from here to here. You're actually you're walking from here to here because the activity that you want to do can be serviced here rather than a long way. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm now going to invite, not Oz Chowdhury, uh, but uh, Keith Kelly from uh, Enterprise and Nathan Ride from LiftShare, who are going to tell you about um, what I think is quite an exciting bit of uh, place-based decarbonisation innovation uh, that's going on in the region. So, without any further ado, I'll hand it. Good morning. Uh, there's still an outside chance of that fire alarm, so I won't be offended if you all get up and leave. But unless there's a fire alarm, of course. So uh, this isn't Oz. I'm Nathan from LiftShare. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, we're going to try and, uh, and capture the mood and, uh, and share with you something that we regard as uh, hopefully a bit of pioneering innovation that's uh, enterprise, significantly larger, uh, but privately owned uh, than LiftShare. LiftShare are small. We behave like a startup, although we're 21 years old, based in Norfolk. And despite the name, LiftShare is far more now than just uh, an app and a bit of software that puts bums on seats in motor cars. Uh, we've come a long, long way in the last 20 plus years, and I'm delighted to say that we're going to uh, hopefully share something quite exciting with the guys over at Enterprise. So, um, why Enterprise? Why, why are we elected to work with them? Uh, the obvious reasons, uh, great national coverage, 470 plus locations, over 100,000 vehicles, uh, coverage within 10 miles, 90% of uh, the population, uh, and over 5,000 employees, that's just bragging, we're 31. Um, but the, the real reason is that we share a DNA with, uh, or a similar DNA to, to those guys, in that we are committed to innovation, and we do realise that the shared economy could unlock some really immediate gains in terms of all the challenges that the previous speakers have, uh, have discussed around uh, decarbonisation, <coughs> access to work, and similar. So uh, we've set about over the last seven or eight months uh, pulling together a project which um, we think is premised on nothing other than, than common sense and doesn't, uh, doesn't require billions of pounds worth of infrastructure. So before we uh, head into that, I'll hand over and... Uh... Just uh, a few other points about Enterprise that you might not know. We are a privately owned business, but we're a family owned business. So we don't have shareholders and we're able then to invest with the support of the Taylor family into the medium and long term and to innovate in terms of shared mobility. The other thing I wanted to mention is that this figure of 470, that's, that's branches, that's traditional branches. And I, I would really plead the room to think about car rental in a different way. Uh, everybody who decides to rent a car is actually adopting a form of road pricing because they are paying for their mobility in proportion to their usage. And that is by definition an efficient and a good process to have. Whether that's an individual who decides not to drive around in an estate vehicle for 52 weeks of the year because they're gonna hire one when they need it, or whether it's someone who decides to have one car rather than two cars, traditional rental plays a very important role in a, in a more efficient, greener future for this country. And in addition to that, you've got over 2,200 car club vehicles that are available 24-7, 365 on your streets, to provide you with all the convenience of car ownership, just without the cost and the hassle. And again, because you're paying for that in proportion to your usage, that drives efficiency in great contrast to car ownership, where quite frankly, you've paid all that money, so you're damn well gonna use it, even if you could just walk down the road and buy a pint of milk, okay? This is also you. 
Yeah, so <laughs> it is big. It's how well we've rehearsed this. So um, obviously Nathan's already alluded to lift share. There's a, there's a great difference in the two organisations in terms of scale. But obviously we've got a long track record, both of us, in terms of experience <laughs> of, of projects. And our DNA, again, is to try and look at the vehicle and not necessarily demonise it, but find better ways for it to be efficient. If Martians came down, they would look at the invention of the internal combustion engine and they would marvel at it in some ways, but they think we were absolutely nuts the way we have used it. And yet the assets sit around 98% of the time, not being very not being very well used. And when they are used, I think the figure before for West Yorkshire was 90% of the time, there's a single occupant. So together, Enterprise and Liftshare are finding ways to challenge that, not in six months time, not in two and a half years time, but now and in the next six months, okay? I think we can go on to the next one. So I'll let you absorb that at, at a later date. The, we're gonna uh, play a video now, which is uh, to, to quote Keith, who just talked about us being nuts. Um, he's absolutely spot on. The, the premise of this whole partnership is using, uh, using stuff better. So using less assets or the assets that we've got and just being a bit smarter in their application to avoid the unnecessary duplication. And I think as we progress through the ages, the notion of, uh, of an old fashioned asset, mine was a, a G plate Vox, uh, Vauxhall Astra, uh, which leaked all over my father's drive, which he wasn't pleased about, but that's another anecdote. But the point there is that that ownership, that notion of ownership is no longer that compelling. So I've got teenage daughters, 17 and 18 years old, they're more interested in the journey being the asset and the subsequent experience. They're not necessarily preoccupied with ownership. This next video, if you hit play, Keith, um, I, I apologize, it's the West Midlands that we're, we're working on or, or reflecting on here, um, but I think it makes quite a compelling statement about the art of the possible. So I'll draw your attention once the video starts to play to the top left-hand corner which is the time of day. So we focus on the commute. That's our sort of bread and butter, working with large organizations to understand where the peak or the pitch points are. And all these are active shared journeys over uh, just a, a one morning commute taken from our live dashboard. We, we're probably helping facilitate upwards of a million shared trips a month at the moment, but this is all in one day. So you can see that the miles saved, the CO2 offset, so a big part of the day and what we're looking at. And the money saved is what the individuals are saving, so they're not having to pay to park, they're not paying for the associated cost of their fuel or their running costs. When you start to scale that up, we look at the aggregated gains. It stands to reason that a number of people traveling to site A may all be passing through similar road networks. Uh, they may live in, uh, they, they, they may live in similar parts of the, of the country. They may they even sit in the same neighborhoods. And the reality is the, the opportunity to share is then scaled up to the power of four. You can see the numbers now. If you pull all those numbers together, you've got carbon savings of 2,000 kilograms here, 1,000, 300, upwards of 3,000 here. And this is happening on a daily basis. Imagine all these journeys were in fact done in a, in a single occupancy vehicle. You've immediately got a resilience of the network issue to contend with. So beyond the beyond the savings, you've got a practical issue. You just simply cannot accommodate more and more motor cars. Um, needless to say, we work up and down the UK, and there are there are some gaps um, yeah, in our network. But if we pull this out now, you can see the enormous impact that common sense is making. Our technology facilitates the sharing. Yes, we we do have apps, and so we're not the unique in that regard but a lot of what we do is premised as well on behavior change so we have people on the ground working with organizations who might be driven by access to work challenges they might be driven um, by a, a, an internal environment agenda um, they may have um, issues with their recruitment and retention we have a, a client in the nhs in the north of england who struggles to the tune of about 25 percent recruitment and retention that comes at a cost and we've established that five percent of that workforce are choosing to leave their employees simply because of access to work issues. So you can see at scale what sharing represents and what could be achieved. And I would stress that that is the assumptions there are that these are privately owned vehicles or what we would regard as grey fleet. So if we then get into the notion of using our technology, our behaviours, and then overlay that with an enterprise car club vehicle, we really start to see the gains of what we've termed the shared asset model. Or sound. 
Okay, so you've got a flavour there for what Enterprise does and what LiveShare does, but what we've started to discuss and we're in the process of implementing in a city in the north of England in the next few weeks and months is taking it to the next level. So we called it the shared asset model, and it's basically taking a car and making it both a car club car and a car share car in different locations at different times to meet different needs and making the best possible use out of that vehicle and that unit. So, for example, it could be a leisure vehicle. So let's use an example. Um, I'm going to pick on the University of Leeds. Probably lots of University of Leeds employees live in Weatherby. Uh, Weatherby was beaching, so it has no train station. So those employees may be currently individually driving in in their own vehicles. Let's imagine three of those individuals live in Weatherby and through LiftShare, they're convinced that they can share a vehicle and come into campus and into the city centre in a low emission, new clean vehicle sharing that vehicle. So that vehicle leaves Weatherby in the morning. It comes to the centre of Leeds. It then ends its car club car share booking. It then becomes an asset in the city centre for people to use that vehicle, whether that's university employees, whether it's students or whether it's people in the business or retail community in Leeds during the day. Uh, in the evening, it goes back to Weatherby and acts as a car share car club vehicle. OK, and then it's available during that evening for the people of Weatherby to use as an alternative to car ownership because they can book it by the hour during the evening. It then comes back to Leeds, comes to campus, becomes a corporate resource or community resource for Leeds City Centre. And that continues to happen until Friday night. And then on Friday night, it sits in Weatherby and it is a community resource for that community through to Monday morning. Does that make sense? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to take the strengths of Car Club, the strengths of lift share, put those two things together, solve problems for rural communities in this case, Weatherby doesn't have a car club at the moment, doesn't have a train station, solve a problem for employers, which is in this case, the university should be using that land to educate people. If it's an NHS trust, it should be using that land to make people better and manage their health issues. Uh, and we're creating a better solution for the individuals who can share a vehicle and review their relationship with car ownership. OK, so another example could be you might take a large employer close to a national park to so say the University of Bradford, and you might find that there's a cluster of University of Bradford employees who live in Grassington. And those individuals could adopt this model, commute in a shared vehicle into the university campus, creating a car club car share service for Grassington and enhancing the, the shared mobility options in the city centre. Okay, anything to add, Nathan? No. So uh, Keith talked there about a nice little segue, talked about clusters. So that leads me into the next slide, which uh, beyond this one, the next next slide, compelling number though, 38 million empty seats on the daily commute. But there is an element of science around how we assisted enterprise in relocating those car club assets Keith just talked about. So there are a number of clients that will have car clubs sitting on their campus or at their workplace, say 30 or 40 vehicles. Typically, they are just used for business to business travel during the working day. Outside of those periods, they simply gather dust. However, the people that access those vehicles during the working day are driving their own private cars in and out of sight, grey fleet vehicles. There's a, an economic cost there because the, um, there's, the employer is having to reimburse, so they're having to pay the mileage cost to that individual, not to mention the fact that three people who are potentially going to be working in the community have all driven their own private cars, which need parking, which uh, can contribute to the congestion, the poor air quality. There are a number of negatives associated with that. But nonetheless, when they get there, they all jump in a, in a shiny enterprise car club vehicle. Seemed like a missed opportunity to us in that what we could do using this technology is help enterprise essentially relocate. So all these dots on here, they allude to individual postcodes or clusters of postcodes where individuals are living. So using GDPR in the first instance, we'll map out where an employer's employees are based and where they're traveling to and from. And if nothing else, that tells you the art of the possible. It will go on then. You see these two little, uh, these inner circles here, they are your active travel zone. So we heard one of the speakers earlier on talking about active travel. That radius there is one and a half miles or 30 minutes. This radius here is five miles 
or 30 minutes for cycling, walking and cycling. But an alarming number of people there are choosing, for one reason or another, to drive to and from work. There's a little bit of um, evidence-based solution there. And if you wanted to mandate internally, you could enforce some really quite rigorous parking around permits or similar. So that's your, uh, your active travel zones. As we scale out, you can then see these red dots. And a red dot would typically point to where there had previously been insufficient access to public services. So we can see very quickly that there are inadequate services offered by the public service operator. And we talk about them being viable. And a viable service is anything that falls outside of twice the time it would take in my, in my car. So if I can't get there on the bus twice as quickly, then I'm going to use my car because my time at the front end and the back end of my day is very, very valuable. So when we shared this data with Enterprise, it was very, very easy for us to help them relocate these assets. So now the assets sit in strategic locations where we've evidenced up, upwards of nine individuals could share the journey to and from the site. Once they get to the site in question, which is uh, about to lose 150 parking spaces, these individuals will have the guarantee of a parking space and they will also know that there's a community asset there ready for them to do their business to business work. Um, the other interesting piece about this particular piece of technology is that we will happily and readily share, not only with enterprise to help them locate their assets, but public transport operators as well. So it should come as no surprise that we work with the likes of Nextbike, Arriva, Click in helping them understand where to place demand responsive transit. Uh, we work with Stagecoach. We'll work with any operator who has an asset, whether that be a docked electric bike for first mile, last mile, because we firmly believe there are there's a sufficient number of assets, whether they be cars, bikes, trains, or buses, but the, the behavior change needs to be influenced by some common sense. And by doing this, we can work with it. in the first instance with an employer who has a direct link into his or her employee, and we can start to have some really grown up conversations. If beyond that, there's um, some more punitive measures like clean air zones or ultra low emission zones, we can, we can then start to understand who should benefit or might not benefit from having these services on their doorstep. Um, you can really scale the whole piece up and we, we're in talks at the moment with Siemens, the technology company. We're able to evidence when a car club vehicle passes through, for instance, a, uh, an ultra low emission zone, our technology will validate that that is a shared journey and a shared asset. That would then ping an API off to Siemens to indicate that that individual, those individuals can pass without having to incur the tariff. So again, we've talked about transport poverty. It's often the case that people driving the dirtier cars or the higher emitting cars are on low incomes, and it doesn't necessarily follow that they should be penalized from the outset. So all of these things neatly blend together, uh, and we, we are pioneering it, we are trialing it. Um, I would hope that the first trial will be live and signed off by the end of January 2020. But I think the takeaway from all of this is um, we're having a go. There are going to be some huge learnings. We've had some interesting conversations with HMRC, but they're, they're coming around. They're, they understand our point of view. Um, it's two companies that you might not have assumed would be working together from the offset. Um, but there is a solution to be had there, and it really is common sense about you using sort of less stuff, but just being a bit smarter in terms of how we use it. Keith, anything to uh, sign off with there? Uh, no, we'll be here for the rest of the day, and we were given the five minutes, six minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your patience. <laughs>20 minutes, we better go straight into questions. Starting the same. Um, you can just speak into it, Anthony. No? Okay. Sorry. Is it working? No. no. no I thought it wasn't. <laughs> Try another one. Hello. Oh. 
Is that one not? It's yeah, there you go. Working. You've got to shout a little uh, bit. <laughs> my name is Anthony Ray, and I'm a representative of civil society, uh, environmental and transport campaigning organisations. Ian Palmer, you've already heard from me, Transport for Great Manchester. I'm Anya Bramich, I'm from a company called Zero Carbon Futures. We specialise in supporting cities and towns to adapt to the um, uh, to electric vehicles. Hi, I'm Emma Moody, I work for the Lake District National Park Authority as Lead Strategy Advisor for Sustainable Transport. Yeah, hello, I'm Monica Buschel, I'm at Lancaster University and I lead the Societal Readiness and Social Acceptance Team in Decarbonate. Thanks very much. This panel is about societal readiness and social acceptance climate um, of, of adaptation and mitigation in transport. Is that a fair summary? Um, so, um, with, because we haven't got much time, I think uh, I'm going to ask for questions um, to the panel on how we bring people with us. How do we make um, uh, social change and societal readiness happen? So let's let's do as Greg did and do three three at a time. Question here. Thanks, Alison Ford from Newcastle University. Uh, Ian mentioned um, demand reduction, but then showed kind of some some graphs that went if demand went up, so the demand for travel. So being a modeler and then a modeler too, how do we use models to look at far more radical futures where demand goes down considerably rather than staying level or, or going up in the future? And I guess the same applies to transport for the north as well. Okay. Yeah, let me see. There was another question. Yeah, just uh, let's go there, just behind you, and then to the lady over there. Uh, Steve, Steve Bigley from Lancaster University. In terms of society, society readiness, I was wondering about uh, are people people are transitioning from shopping in, in city centres to uh, internet shopping? I heard recently that um, in terms of fashion internet shopping, 25% of what people buy online is returned by freight. You know, is society ready? to quickly change their shopping habits. Uh, so it's, it's a slightly different thing. You know, we, we're just being, we're being driven, driven down that route. And I just see that as being a big issue in terms of emissions, in terms of what, you know, sort of going to the house and coming back again. Okay. Um, there. Hi, I'm Jenny Wiles from Living Streets, where the UK charity for everyday walking. Um, and so obviously we, as an organisation, have got a lot of ideas about how we can um, help society to walk more and enable um, people to walk more. But I'm interested to get your thoughts, I think particularly in the context of today, um, when we're thinking about uh, technological innovation and things like that. And maybe the beauty of walking is it doesn't need all of that stuff. It's really simple and easy. But how do we then get that communication out there? We're a small charity. How can wider um, you know, business and researchers help us to do that? Right. So um, three questions there on how you do demand mod modelling to do radical stuff, um, as opposed to business as usual, I suppose. Um, uh, shopping, are people actually ready to, 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 to think about any of this stuff if 25% of fashion um, buying is returned? And um, uh, walking. Um, uh, Monica, because you're leading the societal uh, readiness, you better start by explaining what you're doing and then uh, if you address those questions. Uh, yeah, I'd like to address the questions actually with a, a question um, myself. Um, the way people understand societal readiness levels or social accept acceptance, um, there seems to be quite a bit of confusion about it. Um, because um, how I would answer the questions, um, how to use models um, to understand demand more, would be how can we show people what, it, what they are demanding and what the consequences of that demand is, and how can we make those models societally ready in a way that that helps people then to change the way they, they work? Um, the same with uh, shopping. How can we make online shopping, or actually uh, coming back to what Ian said earlier, to put the shop back into the neighborhood so that people can walk to the shop? How can we make those kind of uh, quite radical uh, <laughs> design changes in how we organize our cities at the moment, societally read, ready. So it's not about how getting, how are we getting 
uh, people to change their behavior? How do we get them to change? It's how do we make the innovations that we make societally acceptable? So how can we enhance their acceptability? To, so I think we've got it the all wrong with uh, societal readiness and societal ac acceptance at the moment. It needs to be the other way around. How are our innovations more acceptable and how can we make them more acceptable? Did you, did you want to comment on the, um, question, the living streets question about walking? Um, the, the same with walking. It isn't um, about um, people's, people make choices, but it isn't just about changing people's attitudes to make, but to make them make the better choice. Our cities aren't walkable because the shop isn't in the neighborhood. Um, because the school is 20 miles away, social housing isn't near work, so it, it, it is unfair to say, you know, you make the right choice. We have, at the societal readiness levels of our urban designs is very poor. Um, and um, if I may, um, I would also like to ch challenge Anya maybe a, a little bit on the electric vehicles. So if, you know, if I was talking about societal readiness levels, I'd put electric vehicles on level three, a nice concept. Um, but how do we get it to level eight, which would be a livable, practicable um, means of having um, electric vehicles as part of a big mobility change transformation? That requires much more. Um, and um, the kind of thinking that we just saw with lift chair, um, where a lot more uh, uh, considerations are being made into how people actually uh, need to commute and what the, the reasoning behind their, their practices are um, seems to be more complex. So, do, do you want, Anya, since you've been mentioned, do you want to pick that up? Uh, I, I think, I think um, your zero, if I've got this right, zero carbon zero. futures position isn't that EVs are the end, uh, uh, be all and end all, it's they're, they're part of it. So. Absolutely, and I want to be very clear about that. We see electric vehicles being part of that vehicle mix of the future and they're actually an essential part of the mobility as a service going forward. And like looking at the mix between things like including electric vehicles into car clubs, looking very specifically at taxis, you know, taxis are a major you know, transport polluter out there that actually we need to be doing much more to be converting taxi companies to look at electric cars and the opportunities that that brings to them. Um, we are still very much at an innovation, uh, an innovator stage of the whole transition um, to electric cars in terms of the technology and the consumer's perceptions are changing as technology grows, but actually from a consumer perception point of view, people are still seeing electric cars as inferior to what they can get from a petrol and diesel model. And of course, they are still so, they're more, much more expensive than the petrol and diesel alternative. So we need to be doing much more to kind of to support that transition as part of the mobility service as looking like the lift share option, the car club option, the taxi option, looking at those and not just looking at the individual as a driver. Okay. Um do you want me to pass it for that term? I wanted to bring you in because you've just yeah. been... Yeah. yeah. You want me to answer all three? Um, if you want to answer all so three... I want to answer all three. Well, I'll give it a go. Yeah. Um, firstly, on the um, sort of modelling and, and demand reduction. Now, I'm not a modeller, I'll have to say. Um, so I don't know um, as much as a lot of people in this room. But I would say that um, we're talking about, you know, modelling increased demand. But there's still a lot of uncertainty about how people's travel behaviour will change. Um, it's always been already been mentioned that young people are getting driving license later. They don't have the the same wish to buy a car um, as soon as they turn 17, or they can't necessarily afford to buy a car as soon as they turn 17 either. So it's a, it's a bit of both. So um, I think we should um, definitely, as, as Ian said, move away from the sort of predict and provide, um, and start looking at how we can. Um, develop um, our transport systems to enable them to be lower carbon um, rather than saying this is what's needed. Um, the next question was about internet shopping. Um, now that is a really interesting point um, and I know as someone that lives in a, a rural area and does do a lot of internet shopping that you know, a lot of it's about perception. You know I'm thinking I'm doing the right thing because I'm not driving the 20 miles to my nearest big shopping centre, but am I? And 
do, is that even measured? You know, uh, if I buy something from the internet, sometimes the same order from the same company will come in three different vans. Um, but what other deliveries are those vans or cars doing on that day? Um, should there be some way of tracking and measuring that so at least I as a consumer, and I'm speaking very much as a consumer here because I don't have an expertise in it, but, you know, so I can make that, that judgment as to um, how much um, carbon I'm saving or creating by doing that internet shopping. Um, now, the walking point is, is one very, very close to my heart because, yes, walking is absolutely key to, to carbon reduction. It is the, the cheapest, the simplest, um, the most easily accessible for a lot of people, clearly not for everyone, but, um, but for a lot of people. And so many journeys are of walkable distance. It's also got huge health and well-being um, benefits. Um, I certainly know from working in the National Park that it's something that people want to do. Um, it's, a, it's an experience, they're getting out there, getting the fresh air. Um, and I'd like to be able to um, work with um, more, some of the more urban authorities um, to build on that benefit. So if someone walks while they're on holiday in the Lake District, they think, yes, that, that feels good, I feel better for that. How can they get, then take that back home um, and take that into their daily life so that they can take that, back some of that good feeling? So uh, that's my challenge. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Ian, uh, just before you go on, I, I've just spotted um, some link up between Living Streets and the Ramblers Association in terms of uh, joining up urban and rural uh, walking and the link up between um, the societal readiness work and the freight network, uh, which I'm sure as uh, Greg had already spotted, but it seems to me that that, that last discussion uh, picked up. Uh, Ian, as a lapse modeler, do you want to comment particularly on the demand modeling uh, question? Uh, hopefully, shortly. I think transport modeling has been for years about getting investment in new infrastructure from the Department of Transport. And therefore, the more growth you have, the more chances that you're going to get your scheme through. That's why, in, inherent in my heart, or in practice, that's what happened. So breaking out of the sector, breaking out of what that modeling has been used for, will, will release us. Uh, we haven't been released yet. I think in a devolved world within Great Manchester, by bringing in those other sectors, I'm increasingly being challenged by housing planners, living streets type type agenda, pedestrians walking uh, to, to create a different evidence base. So I think that's one thing. I think the different evidence base allows you to make brave decisions. Politicians, and I keep reminding the new graduates we've got to, to watch Yes Minister, uh, and the uh, article about the integrated transport. I think it was still there. Uh, brave decisions can be informed by society so society uh, extinction rebellion politicians do respond to those sorts of things but a lot of time they are uh, constrained by the existing uh, arrangements and existing uh, infrastructure decision making infrastructure and i think we need to change the evidence base to try and help them make those those different decisions uh, i think great manchester the introduction of the walk and in cycling commissioner chris boardman uh, has shook things up a bit certainly for me uh, he's got a different, a, 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 not so different agenda, a different way of making things happen, uh, and therefore how we try and link transport to activity uh, to try and make walking uh, a viable option. Uh, and he gives us this uh, sort of challenge of make it usable by a 12 year old. So you as a parent, will you send your 12 year old on that trip, either by walking or cycling? And that's the standard of infrastructure that we need. Uh, and as someone with a 15 year old, I still wouldn't send them on some of the trips that they should be making by walking and cycling. So something about evidence base, informed by society, but helping politicians in a more structured, in existing planning frameworks, help them make uh, braver decisions. Thank you, Anthony. Yes, I just want to follow uh, Ian's basic point there, that the purpose of modelling has been previously understood to be model increased demand and therefore to cater for that demand. The primary purpose of modelling uh, uh, in, a, in a decarbonisation uh, context has, been to, has, been, has to be to model decarbonisation pathways. And at the moment, the problem that civil society finds as we, if you like, walk up and down the various levels of transport governance is that there is a, 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 a failure to recognise that that should be the primary purpose of, of of, of uh, policy, and then there becomes a whole series of, of, uh, of, 
of issues about getting political acceptance of that, getting it, getting the modeling of those pathways done to an acceptable level of, uh, of, 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 of um, expertise. So it's, so what we need is a, is a fundamental reorientation of the purpose of modeling. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take a very quick round of, uh, uh, if we can, um, I think it's known as the quick fire round or some cliche. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, other questions, comments on societal readiness? Um, one of them. Uh, I'll come back in again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I'm going to put the left the room. Um, so, um, here she is. Can you put your hand up again, please? Thank you. Uh, Paul Foster from uh, Leeds City Council. Um, I just wonder, in terms of uh, change, but how much influence the panel feel uh, public government council intervention needs to be in some of these uh, future forms of mobility? And how do we ensure that they don't leave behind the most vulnerable in society and we get an equitable solution from the uh, technology that's come forward? Equity and technology, and there's one here, I think. One, yeah, one here. And any more? Oh, well, we. Well, back, back up the front. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, one there, yeah. Okay, since you're there. Hello, sorry, it's Louise, I'm from Park um, in the City Sheffield Green Area. <coughs> Not really heard a lot about air pollution um, and how, I wonder what the panel think about <laughs> using the health stats and the premature deaths from air pollution to influence the public at all. Okay, um, and I think one over here. So, can you put it over here? Uh, <laughs> um, um, yeah. Let me just swap it around. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Katie Pruitt, your consultant in the Guardian Life Enterprise Partnership. Um, we spoke very briefly about the price uh, point here. How can we, um, through policy measures, influence price points to improve the uptake of public transport? Because it's the price point and the quality that are really um, the drivers for, for a lot of people not taking up public transport. Okay. Um, right. um, so, uh, I think we better try those. Uh, you're going to bring the mic down. Um, Right, sorry about that. Um, so, um, technology, future technology and equity, um, air quality using health stats to persuade the public, and prices. Price. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, the equity, as a public authority, when new mobility type services come in, that, that's the big question that we face about how do we intervene in this? Uh, area and Great Manchester had an experience with he said had experience with, with Mobike uh, and that was a big learning exercise for us. How do we respond? How do we engage? Uh, and that's part of the reason why I'm keen for decarbonate and in terms of our future mobility zone. That's one of the exercises we're going to try and do. What we want to learn from that. Uh, in terms of uh, air pollution, clearly lots of cities uh, this leads and uh, Great Manchester going through clean air plan processes. I think that's what I mean by let's talk about brave decisions. We've had this data about the uh, NO2 problems for a long time as a country, uh, and sorting out whose problem it is to solve has taken us about a decade. Uh, and then there's this issue about who's, who's going to pay for the, the, the uh, remedial measures and the mitigation measures. Uh, so there's big challenges about how we govern decision making and how we respond to things. So you might have a, a, a sort of a clean air crisis for a while, but how the countries respond to it, we really need to learn a lesson about how we mobilise ourselves to solve that and what can that tell us about carbon as well. Uh, and then in terms of price points uh, and public transport, what really surprises me is how people don't really understand that concept of price the extent to which our systems are, are subsidized or whether they cover their operating costs or whether they can actually then return money to pay for the capital investment in the first place. So we at one stage talk about the Great Manchester 
metrolink system as how great it is uh, how reliable and it's wonderful and it kind of returns money to help pay for itself and the next time uh, we're talking about how affordability and it's really expensive and the same people are saying the same things so I get a bit more evidence of understanding of what we actually subsidizing and, and, and why I think would help inform a different debate about when people say I want public transport to be affordable what do we really mean by affordable but it's affordable for people for the public sector and who's picking that up? Um, I'm specifically like to touch on the question from the back there on um, the public government intervention, especially when it comes to electric vehicles and electric vehicle infrastructure. Um, one of the public's biggest barriers to driving electric or to switching to electric is actually what we understand is, is it's their perception of the lack of charging infrastructure. They want to see charging infrastructure, regardless of whether it's actually being used at, at, at the moment. But it's, it is a still a chicken and egg scenario in that people's perception is that they couldn't switch to a different form of transport without that infrastructure being in place for them. Um, so then it comes to the question of actually what role is it that the public sector should be playing in that um, infrastructure installation? And it's again, it comes back to using data, it's using looking at the data and the evidence to inform the decisions of where um, council should be investing, because at the end of the day, it's about making sure that actually that investment is put <coughs> in the right location for the right type, for the right driver. Um, we're seeing a lot of private investment into this field at the moment, but actually the biggest question that we have been asking at the moment is, you know, how do you make a different form of transport sustainable for all aspects of society? So we see private investors coming into the market, they are looking at the quick wins, they're looking at the business case, they're looking at the areas that actually they think they're going to make some money out of, but actually how do you make that fair? And I think that's where local authorities and public sector investment needs to come in. Um, yes, how do we make um, it, uh, the solution equitable? Um, not easy, um, but important. Um, I'd say the first thing to bear in mind is that majority of carbon emissions come from the wealthier sections of society. So if we're looking at carrots and sticks, the sticks need to be um, affecting them and the carrots need to be making it easier for people on low income to, uh, to move around. Um, air pollution, again, a really important issue. And again, if we're talking about equity, um, it affects the poorer sections of our society more so. Um, I think it's it is a very telling story that hopefully will help influence people um, in their travel choice. And I think it's one of, of many stories that will work differently for different people. So the carbon um, effects is, is, will affect some people and they you know, will make them think about changing their behavior, air pollution and um, air quality and its effect on, on particularly children's health is, is another one that will affect other people more deeply. So uh, we need to, we need to think really carefully about how we how we tackle that. But often, it, it, you know, the same measures will affect both. Um, not always, I admit. Um, and the price, again, very difficult to tackle. And I I think you know it's about putting investment in the right place. But I can't get political at this current time. Um, but I would say. Um, you know, it, it always puzzles me, you know, why can it be cheaper to fly than to get the train in a lot of cases? Um, why can it be cheaper to hire a car than to hire a bike as well, you know, in certain instances? You know, that something is wrong with the market if, if this is the case. Um, but I'm not sure how we can put it right. Okay, good. Can I just ask Anthony to come in and then Monica finish up, if that's all right? <laughs> Sorry, Anthony. Um, so, again, I just want to follow... Uh, a general point that uh, Ian made about, I think something about mobilizing the evidence in support of, 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 of positive change. Uh, and my point would be that, and it's, it's I suppose it's, you know, Greg asked us to, to, uh, to challenge various things. My, my, uh, my uh, contribution, if you like, at the start of this would have been to, to, to challenge the, the, a, an implied, uh, um, uh, primacy or, 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 or first um, emphasis upon societal readiness at all because before you can uh, 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 seek to uh, uh, achieve benefits from 
uh, mobilizing societal readiness analysis, you need to have uh, what, what I was going to call policy framework readiness. And that if you don't have uh, all of those, those frameworks in place at all, all the various levels of transport governance, then you're going to find it very difficult to get a, 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 an, an, an effective societal response. I mean, I'm sure I'm not the only one who noticed uh, Lucy's, uh, in Lucy's slides that there was, she talked about, a lack of central government policy on decarbonisation. Uh, and that uh, there isn't a huge amount of guidance from the UK government. I'm really just unclear how decar decarbonate is going to be able to, uh, and all, all the partners in the room are going to be able to uh, uh, move that mission forward without an increased mobilisation of policy framework readiness. Uh, and then we can move on to uh, the equally important issues of societal uh, uh, readiness as as well. <coughs> Monica, do you want to finish up the yeah. session? I'm yeah. sorry, it's but had to be so uh, compressed. No, it's, we, have, we have plenty of time for discussion in the, over the rest of the day, so and it's really good to uh, have people's names and the network continues, so there's plenty of time for discussion. Um, I'd like to come back to the part of the question, um, how much influence can uh, city councils have? Um, I think it could be massive. Um, so you could use the societal readiness levels um, framework to actually evaluate innovations in your procurement. So you, if mobility justice was one of the criteria that makes an innovation um, more or less societally ready, um, then that could be um, really helpful in uh, you commissioning it or, or not. Um, and so um, that could also provide better justification for punitive measures. So if, so, if you um, introduce measures that are high on societal readiness and provide um, for mobility justice, then if you have to also introduce um, uh, uh, restrictions on private car use, then you can do it because you have the justification that um, and the, the reality of the innovation that um, it provides for um, more equity in um, mobility as a as a service, mobility as a common resource um, that is shared within the community. Um, with regard to the air pollution question, um, that there are some uh, historical um, uh, references that we can make. Uh, in the 19th century, Manchester was one of the most air polluted um, cities in the world. And for 100 years, people campaigned in networks like, like this, and nothing happened. And what the things that actually changed um, the, the capacity for society tra to transport was in part modeling. So cities modeled how polluted the air was, and they showed it to people. So they made it comparable. And then something really terrible happened. The London smoke, where 12,000 people died, and it was possible to trace that back to the models and the, the cause and effect. So if we think of modeling, like Anthony says, the, the, the CO2 and the damage and the decarbonizing uh, progress that we're making, we're giving society good measures to, to, to um, make change. And um, I think I'll stop there because I don't really know quite how to address the question on affordability. Thank you very much. And, uh... I should thank Annie for stepping in uh, as uh, uh, Jersey's um, voice had given out. So uh, uh, thanks very much for, for stepping in at uh, short notice for uh, uh, the, the, the panel. Um, uh, I'd, I'd now like to invite um, Greg to say what's going to happen now in relation to um, uh, lunch and workshops. Yeah, OK, so lunch is going to be really soon. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's <laughs> really good news. Uh, no, it was my chairing earlier. I think that got us into the late conditions. Um, so, uh, just a couple of things. Uh, so, lunch is out there. They're going to um, break this room down into two rooms for the afternoon session, and then there's a third room that we'll be using. Three rooms. Oh, this is going to be three, right? Broken into three rooms. So, um, I guess I'm saying don't leave your stuff on the chairs, take it out with you. There is a third store room just past the buffet on the right hand side where you can leave some. Uh, some things. If you haven't signed up for the afternoon workshops when you arrive, uh, 
when you are uh, getting your badge. Uh, you do need to do that. We've got different capacities in the different rooms, so don't just assume you can turn up to, to the one that you want to go to if you haven't signed up for it. If you've got any questions, ask the people with the green sashes, uh, Shona, Tina <coughs> around. Um, otherwise, enjoy your lunch and hope to hear lots more discussion going on over that. Thank you very much to the panel and to Steve. Thank <laughs> you.